uh, in light of this significant anniversary, we'll now hold a conversation with some, some of our young folks. Um, and the panel will be facilitated by our good friend Dave Denyer. Um, and we will be inviting all of you here to, uh, to participate. Dave is a longtime friend, and he is, in fact, a perfect choice for this task. He was educated at the University of London in the UK and at UVic, and he earned his bachelor degree, a bachelor of education degree, and a master's of education. Dave taught junior school in, New in southwest London, but emigrated to Canada and afterwards taught in Campbell River and in Cowichan. He joined the Cowichan School District in 1975 as a district music teacher. I didn't even know that. But after cutbacks resulted in cancellation of his music program, of course, in 1981, he taught all grades at the elementary level, including kindergarten music. He was continuously involved in the teachers' union since the 1970s. He became president of the CDTA from 1981 to 86 during the first board firing, and again from 2001 to 2004. Dave was a member of the BCTF executive in the 80s and on staff at the BCTF from 2004 to his retirement last August. All this adds up to 46 years of involvement as a teacher, a teachers' union representative, and a staff member. When he retired, he had been the editor of BCTF's teacher magazine. During the discussion, Dave will pose several questions to our panel and will also seek comments from all of you. When you are asked, please keep your remarks as brief as possible so we can, get, we can allow as many people uh, as we can to participate. And Dave will conclude the situation and sum up a little about, for us about what we've all heard. I now call on Dave to introduce our panel, who I think are going to kind of introduce themselves. But. Uh, thank you, Eden, for that very kind introduction. Um, as Eden mentioned really at the very outset, and it's been said now a number of times, um, we're looking ahead to the next 100 years. That's a pretty ambitious timeline. Um, but we did set that task for the panelists who you see, and they turned their minds to that very topic in a very broad way. So we're not so much looking back, of course, um, and analyzing what has happened to us and to our political life, but looking forward. And the way we defined the questions was through a preliminary discussion that we had with them. And uh, this was particularly informative, I found, as I think everyone who was there found as well. Uh, so they, in fact, came up with the questions that are going to be posed. And so what we will do is ask each of them to respond quite briefly uh, to the questions after we've introduced them. And then we will open it to you to respond. So we're looking for maybe two or three responses from yourselves after each question has been addressed by each member of the panel and then we'll move on to the next question. And hopefully that way we can move ahead at a fairly brisk pace. Otherwise, as you can imagine, a discussion like this with so many people uh, could stretch on for hours. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, our panel, and maybe I can start with John Haythonthwaite at the end. Thank you. Who would like to just say a few words about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, obviously Eden and Alistair's son, uh, third son. Um, yeah, I'm uh, currently a uh, healthcare aide or a community health worker with uh, Beacon Community Services, and uh, I'm also in uh, nursing school right now <clears throat> at Camosun College. I live in Victoria. Um, yeah, I'm uh, quite happy to be here. I am Cameron. I uh, also live in Victoria. I volunteer for Camus Books and Info Shop, a uh, fully volunteer nonprofit educational society. Um, and I have a, a degree in political science and a diploma in social justice studies. Hi there. I'm Brandon McLean. I uh, currently am a student at uh, BIU uh, getting my bachelor's of education. 
My name is Victoria, and I am currently a student at VIU, majoring in anthropology, and I sit on the board of directors for Volunteer Cowichan. And uh, my name's Stephen Portman, and I work at Together Against Poverty Society in Victoria, and I focus primarily on advocacy and representing non-unionized workers in disputes with employers. I also have a BA in poli sci from UVic, and I organize as an activist with Social Coast. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll move right ahead and straight into our first question, which is, are we well served by the current political institutions, meaning the legislatures, parliament, senate, <coughs> parties, conservative, NDP, liberal, and processes, voting, lobbying. And maybe I can start with Brandon. Thank you. Um, in general, I'd say, uh, as far as the current system goes, uh, the actual elections themselves are less and less a uh, vehicle for change and more and more a uh, vehicle for damage control. Um, we don't see a lot of the positive changes in it, like uh, starting through the electoral process and through government. And uh, it, with time, the uh, focus of government has uh, shifted far more towards lobbying-based uh, um, lobbying as being the uh, primary uh, source of policy for governance. Um, this could be for a number of reasons. I'm not sure if it's because elections are uh, once every four years uh, versus lobbying, which would take place year-round. So the uh, actual ex exposure and the uh, responsibility uh, of the politicians would seem to shift in the, under that sort of system. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, despite, you know, uh, the age of the country, it's, what, over 150 years now? Um, we're still w running a first-past-the-post system, which is not a very representative uh, method of doing things. Uh, we attempted to get a uh, single transferable vote in British Columbia, which would it, it provide an alternative to things like strategic voting and other issues, and even that wasn't successful. So it's uh, difficult to say because... Um, uh, I just feel like uh, getting the information out there and having people understand things uh, despite an age of, you know, uh, ease of access for all this information, getting people to understand what it is and what things will do and what the advantages are still seems to be quite an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen. Um, sorry. Uh, it's a, a really big question, um, and in, in thinking about how to answer this question, the easiest answer I can come up with is no. Uh, we are not well served by the current political institutions, parties, and processes. Uh, and then I think there's going to be some more detailed answers, so I'll give you a kind of cheeky answer to this question. Um, I have a, a sarcastic uh, chant that I uh, often uh, share with friends after we go to rallies uh, when we're trying to push for the kind of change that's possible through our current system. And it's, uh, what do we want? Incremental change. When do we want it? Slowly and responsibly implemented over time through a fiscally conservative framework in recognition of the neoliberal realities that exist in our community. <laughs> So uh, my friends and I share this, this chant often uh, over the last few years, and uh, I was really excited, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people in this room were, when we saw that there might be a shift in uh, the political fortunes of our province in the recent election. And we we're very excited because the last time we saw a shift in the ruling power provincially, uh, there were massive and sweeping changes to law and our communities that happened almost instantly. A brand new Employment Assistance Act and, um, introduced immediately in 2002 with some of the most regressive welfare legislation in North America, a gutting of the Employment Standards Act, 
uh, an, an almost immediate increase in the debt load of students. That happened right away when the Liberals came to power. So I thought, here comes the next provincial election. We're going to see a massive change inside our current political institution. And what was the campaign motto for the NDP? One small step at a time, was it not? So I, or I think that was it. No one's going to help. What's that? We're better or something. One, sorry, thank you, thank you. That's really important. One practical step at a time. And while, and while I believe in being practical, I, and, and I believe in obviously pushing for change, I think if we're going to have a successful uh, uh, political system and structure in BC, it has to be one that dreams bigger than one practical small step at a time. And that's not currently possible in the way that we have organized our party structure and, and system in BC. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victoria. Um, okay, well, I think that if we're going to answer this question, we need to ask, okay, so are we being well served? Well, who is we? And I think that if we look at these institutions and if they are representative of the population, and so in 2011, women made up less than 25% of the House of Commons, yet more than 50% of the population. In 2011, there were seven Aboriginal people elected into the House of Commons. So this is extremely disproportionate to, to the population. Who are the people who make up these institutions? I mean, even if we're looking at human rights, well, where do human rights cases usually come to? Our Supreme Court judges. Well, who are our Supreme Court judges? Well, there's nine of them. Three of them are women, and they're all white. Would you like to be tried by a jury of people who don't represent you in any way? I think that to be well served, I think that we need to have representation in government. And I think that for me, that's, that's where this question comes down to. I think that it's really nice to think that people have everybody's interest at heart, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, a couple years ago, I went to a uh, class full of spirit drummers, you know, and I'm sitting there and it's an Aboriginal spirit drumming group, you know, and in walks Gene Crowder. But, and so I think that that's a beautiful thing, but I don't think that all MPs are like Gene Crowder. So I think that it's unrealistic to expect, um, I think it's unrealistic to expect our institutions who are not representative of the population to well serve the population. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Cam. Yeah, um, I'd agree with that. Now, I would say that uh, these institutions were, are rooted and were developed through the processes of colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism, and that, therefore, they still reflect and are beholden to those sorts of political and, and economic logics. Uh, that's when we talk about the conception of citizenship that they present. We find ones which are completely limited into truly challenging these hierarchies um, in which they're based. There is a complex interplay of uh, coercion and, and consent in which the social relationships which make up these institutions maintain themselves. Um, in this, consent is gained through a perceived co-option of people's interests into the processes of these logics, or processes logics, um, and coercion is used against any who practice politics outside of this prescribed form of citizenship. Um, real change can be made, gained from time to time through the, this pandering for consent, um, and that shouldn't be ignored or, or complete, uh, undervalued. However, consent to these forms of citizenship also aids the system in justifying the coercion against those forms um, outside of those types of politics. Um, you, you see it in the direct force of uh, evicting the Occupy movements throughout the cities. Um, you see it in the uh, cultural forms of coercion when in the reaction to the Montreal students uh, uh, movement and how, you know, while they pay the lowest tuition, how can they be out there doing that? But without recognizing that the protests are part of 
parcel of the reason why they pay less, et cetera. Thank you. And John? Um, well, I could be different by saying we are well represented, but um, I'd be lying to myself and you. Um, yeah, no, I, I you know, uh, Cam and Steve and the others, you know, went into good detail there about the problems. Um, I would just say in general, um, politics, especially, I mean, at a provincial level, obviously, you know, politics are going to be more narrow. You're, you're hamstrung by the fact that you're dealing with, you know, transfer payments from the federal government and things like that. Obviously, the, the provincial government isn't going to be able to do, say, what uh, the federal government can do. But when I look at the federal government, uh, the federal parties, you know, whether it's the conservatives currently in power or even the NDP or the liberals, um, I don't see any vision in actually really confronting the serious political challenges we have in the future. Um, I think of like employment, for instance, uh, for not just for young people, just employment in general. There just seems to be declining opportunities, you know, uh, stagnant, declining wages. Uh, like uh, they're mentioning, you know, declining protections for workers. Um, I don't really see either party, you know, that they'll put forward little things here and there, but I don't see a big vision for that. Um, also, even say the environments, if we're talking about global warming, there is literally, there is a scientific consensus, you know, some of the, you know, smartest people in the world who say, you know, the world is heading toward disaster, that essentially the policies, the, you know, the economic policies Canada is currently pursuing in developing its resources and, and elsewhere in America and all that, we're cooking the planet, which is having, is already, the effects are already starting. You know, we're, we're cooking Africa, we're, we're destroying the world. We can see more than ever the consequences of our actions, but there's no vision. There's no willingness to, to confront these things through existing political framework. So I'd say that more than anything shows how it's not working. Thank you. Um, is there anyone who would like to comment um, leading out of that discussion or responding to it? Yes. In the original question was the word we. Yes. Address that. Uh, my thought and maybe a response if it's possible from them. Uh, the electoral process is a system. And I think the system is not working because the we are not there. They're not participating. And particularly your generation, I mean, maybe you might blame us for making the system so, so rotten that it doesn't represent you. But uh, I fear for the fact that, or at least the perception that I have, that the young are especially the ones that don't participate. And I, I, I would guess you, you guys did vote, but your generation didn't. And that's, that's fearful. When, when we, simply don't participate, they don't believe in the system, they leave the system to others. So really, it's, the system is representing a minority of those who, who did participate. It's not serving your generation very well, but many of your generation who are disproportionately unemployed and disproportionately have less and less of a future. My children, your, your, your generation, who will not enjoy the benefits of my generation. For them it will be very difficult to have a home, you know, a private private house. So unless your generation somehow becomes involved, what system will work? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you for that. And, and I'd like the panelists to hold that thought because I think the second question can be used as a segue into that, addressing that particular point. Uh, any others? Yes. Mr. Parker. 
Stephen. In Stephen. my age. <laughs> Stephen, I love your chant. Because yeah. what I discovered uh, after 10 years of having lived in the lobbyists and committee members and bills that keep coming back again and again and again in exactly the same format that they did six years ago is, is that there's this notion of pragmatic incremental change that somehow are going to make people's lives better. And I can tell you now, it's not. And I think, I think uh, your challenge is exactly not just about young people, but how is it that we collectively, there are more of us than there are of them, why do we continue to accept a system yeah. that continues to make sure that, that we don't succeed? So, thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Charles Wood. I, I uh, want to uh, express my uh, happiness that the youth panel are one mind with the system that doesn't deserve us. And I'm really impressed with Jean's comment as well, for somebody who is excited. Because I think not only are the citizens marginalized, the MPs are marginalized, the members of the legislature are marginalized. And so, in effect, the old system, which is a colonial system, and it served the owners, male owners, white male owners of property very well. <laughs> and it built Canada as a colonial venture of British Empire building in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the challenge really is to us, it seems to me, and your generation as well as our generation, as long as we're still breathing, is um, how do we empower the people? How do we actually create new political mechanisms? There comes a time in history where something new has to be born. Something new has to be created. And I think Canada, if it's to survive as a country, if we're to prevent world war, if we're to create a future for ourselves, um, that is the most pressing problem today. How do we empower ourselves for a, a practical democracy for modern times and use it to affirm the rights of every human being in our society? So democracy, human rights, the right to conscience, the right to organize ourselves, I think these are the real challenges and I, I look forward to you guys being the organizers for that along with the, the rest of us great answer. Thanks. I, I will move along just in the interest of time and, and thank you for those people who've um, uh, contributed. Um, moving to our second question, which may of course lead into um, responding again to what has been said by uh, people in our uh, audience. What is your vision of active citizenship in a democracy? And Cam, can I begin with you this time? Uh, sure. Um, if we consider citizenship, um, pardon me, uh, the conception of citizenship to be about the right to be political and um, both uh, you know, content as well as extent. So who citizenship applies to as well as the ways in which one activates their citizenship. I think uh, the other side of that, of recognizing that, is, is that it's attached to a sense of justice, uh, a sense of, of, uh, of what would be proper social organization. Um, and I th think that the, the extent in which citizenship is, um, the extent in the the institutionalized forms of citizenship is incredibly limiting um, to, th to the point where people are alienated from the actual political processes, where they they're only have a selection of, of different decisions to rectify. They're not actually involved in the, um, the creation of these uh, decisions or um, policies to do with social ordering. Um, and so I think that uh, what's needed is a, an activist uh, citizenship to challenge the um, institutionalized forms in order to expand both the can content and extent as much as possible, finding new forms of being political um, than those can certainly... Uh, right. <laughs> um, and I... Ideally, I, I believe in political parity where um, every individual can engage in that dialogue of social ordering as peers um, in the social ordering of redistribution, uh, cultural recognition, and, uh, and in that form, uh, political representation.
Thank you. And Victoria. Um, I would say that active citizenship um, means taking advantage of the rights and freedoms that are afforded to you uh, through simply being a citizen. So yes, I think that that means voting. Um, like you say, like getting our, our generation definitely motivated and things like that. But I think that I would like a vision of democracy that, that moves beyond participation that looks like simply voting in the elections. Because like you say, you know, you're, you're only given so many options. And, and so really, what are, what are you left with, with those options? Um, and so I think it means going beyond that, being active in your community, um, and however that looks for you, because I think that that looks very different for everybody. If that means volunteering, if that means just being conscious of where you shop. I mean, the capitalist system is made up of supply and demand. Well, what are we demanding that's in the shops? What shops are we demanding are present? Are we, <laughs> are we taking our paycheck every week and going to Walmart and blowing it all there? Or are we, I live in Duncan, so are we going to the Saturday market and spending that money on local farmers, on, on local produce, on things that are locally made? Is that money staying in our community or is it getting shipped abroad? I think that that's the vision of active citizenship that I have. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Stephen. Um, so my vision of active citizenship uh, is one that employs an effective diversity of tactics to uh, realize the kind of communities that we all want to live in or that the citizens within that community decide truly represents them. Um, that's my really quick answer to that question. And then I'll just respond to uh, the comment that, uh, that this gentleman made that you're fearful that uh, we have a generation that's going to reject parliamentary uh, politics uh, to our detriment. And I think that's a very real fear. And when I say diversity of tactics, and, and uh, one of those tactics is to engage uh, with the parliamentary system, uh, both provincially and federally. Um, but I don't, uh, it, it's harder year after year for me in, when it comes down to an election to get my friends to that poll, to those polls. And I think that reflects a reality and I'm fearful of, of that too. But I think that tells us something bigger about that system and, and, and that's a big challenge. And that's why I say a diversity uh, is so important, a diversity of tactics in having an active citizenship, which means thinking about the, the uh, supply and demand economics, uh, supporting local uh, farming initiatives. That means uh, organizing when, when necessary. That means supporting workers on the picket lines. That, that means all of those things. And I think they're so much more real uh, for, for our generation than casting that ballot. Um, but at the same time, once every four years, please cast a ballot. <laughs> it's five John. minutes. Thank you. John? Yeah, um, it's a pretty tough question for me to answer. To be honest, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, an activist in the same way some of the other panelists are. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I am kind of one of those somewhat, you know, disaffected young people that's not particularly politically involved. Um, I did vote. Um, but sometimes I hear people say, oh, well, young people need to become more engaged, they need to vote. I don't think just because you vote means you're politically engaged. Um, you know, once every four years, uh, you know, I voted, most of my friends voted, but beyond that, we aren't politically engaged. Um, and so I think it's tough in a place like Canada because it's, you know, for young people, we it just doesn't seem like, we have no connection to the past, to a kind of past time of political struggle that we can kind of look to and be inspired by. Um, you know, we have a vague idea of the 60s and, you know, what happened then. But, um, yeah, unless, you know, you're kind of involved in student circles, you usually you're not really a part of, you know, these kind of political struggles. Um, and I, I find it, it's funny, too, um, with, uh, I think of Quebec, 
the big student struggles, the huge rallies they had then. And I always find it funny because, you know, our elites and, you know, pundits and stuff, they always want to, you know, kind of talk about, oh, Canada, it's a great democracy, great place to live in. But when those protests happened, I mean, just the way the media talked about it and, and political leaders talked about it, you know, just basically just crapping all over them, just trivializing them. They say, what are they doing? You know, they're just, you know, those Quebecers, they're just a bunch of freeloaders, you know, taking all of taking all us fine, you know, English Canadian provinces money and, you know, because it's a, it's a have not province and all that. So it, it's a tough because I feel like we live in a society that ultimately discourages active political participation and that young people don't, we don't really know, we don't have an example, we don't know where to look for inspiration. Thank you. Uh, Brandon. Um, as far as... Uh, youth not being involved in uh, the political process. I think uh, that could be part of a product of growing up a, a, during a generation where there's just a general pessimism towards anything politics. Um, in Canada, I found uh, even discussing politics seems to be not seen as something that's uh, polite to do in a common conversation. It's, you know, have your opinion, keep it to yourself, and just show up every four years. Um, and so part of that is kind of uh, just an entire change in, like, part of the solution, sorry, uh, to that would be just a general change in the culture surrounding it to make it so that, you know, politics is an active part of our lives. It's something that's important. It's something that, you know, you can freely discuss, understand, uh, disagree on, and, you know, remain respectful of each other. Uh, uh, going along with that is uh, just a complete lack of... Uh, um, knowledgeability as to what happens in politics, what recent events are. Uh, so many people uh, that I've come across just don't seem to follow anything. And uh, I'm not sure if, you know, showing up to vote in that situation is uh, an improvement or not, because if you don't know what you're voting for, you're not really taking part of the political system at all, other than just giving it a sense of legitimacy that perhaps it doesn't deserve. Um, we're in an age, too, where information is so much easier to get around. Uh, the, the connective uh, nature of the Internet, 24-hour um, news media, all these different things, it makes it so that we don't have an excuse for not knowing. It's so much easier to. It's so much easier to actually look in and find out, you know, uh, do research and see what's actually going on. Um, I guess the flip side of that coin, though, is there's... Uh, a sense of information out there can be, well, what's known as spun and, you know, uh, it's it's hard to sometimes tell what is true and what is, you know, just presented in a creatively um, or just completely false, you know, someone could Photoshop an image and all of a sudden everybody gets on there, clicks the uh, like or share or whatever on social media without ever looking into it. They have that moment of outrage. Uh, uh, sense of release where they feel like they've done their duty and just kind of that's all so um but active citizenship in a democracy it, it, it's going to require some changes both to the system and to the culture that uh, we have towards it um moving away from party platforms where you basically get a bundled choice of uh, you know, this goes with this, like uh, our economic policy along with our environmental policy, our healthcare policy, all of that. There's not much for choices. You get these limited number of bundles of uh, three, four parties, five if you're in Quebec, I guess, and that is what your choice is. Um, provincially, it's even more limited. You know, there's four parties, only two of which seem to have an actual chance of forming government, and so long as we have a first-past-the-post system, we're basically inclined to only vote one of two ways, and A or B is hardly a system that's going to encourage uh, involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Now this, um... Yeah, um, very well um, expressed views, and... Uh, I hope you find uh, them to be provocative views as well. Uh, so, uh, yes, you have a comment, please. Yeah, I have two comments, and I'll try to reply to the others. And when Cam started to use the phrase social organization, and I was going to talk about the importance of organizing, and um, when I was your 
storage, I was involved with cooperatives, collectives, and my trade union, the Labor Council. And I learned a lot about, if not the political process, but the process of how to work with other people in groups, you know, in a lot of different ways. So when I got to where I'd come into a meeting and say, are we doing Robert's Rules of Order consensus, or you know, how are we going to do this thing, and then let's do it. And we learned to plan, and we learned to set priorities, and we learned to have goals. And I was really discouraged by I don't know more, and the, the fact that discouragement of the political process seems for some people only to lead to anarchy. And uh, I, I remember an I don't know more non-spokesperson who said, oh, we don't have spokespersons because we believe in the equality of all, so we can't have spokespersons, and no, we don't have a goal. And I thought, what the hell are you taking up space for? Because if you don't even know what you want, then, then why are you having an organization? So I, I found that very discouraging, the tendency towards anarchy. My other point is about how complicated it all is. And the number of jurisdictions that we live with, not just federally and provincially, in Victoria, you have 13 municipalities, four or five Indian bands, and the CRB, and one of the PCC has been killed. Okay. So it's hard to figure all that out. And so the answer to that, I don't know. Is it teaching civics? Is it, um, it seems to all come down to teaching people how to be engaged and how to feel powerful. And there are lots and lots of places to do that. In high school, there's leadership groups, at university, there's all umpteen NGOs and, and places to work with other people and learn how small p politics work. So, sort of disjointed, but anyway, those are my thoughts. Mm, thank you. Yep. Uh, my name is Kip Wood, I live in the Bible. Thank you. Uh, I read an essay years ago by the editor of Harper's Magazine, and he was talking about the transformation of the active citizen into the passive consumer. And I think that's a collective responsibility to reverse that. I don't think it's uh, an individual voting group or, uh, or individual decisions necessarily, but a collective responsibility. And I think our active citizenry depends on our economic security. You can point to pretty much every age group in Canada now and talk about economic insecurity, whether it's student debt, household debt, low minimum wage, high childcare costs, insufficient pensions, whatever it is, precarious employment. There's a lot of factors economically that are keeping us from becoming active citizens more and more. So I think it's unfair for us who have that privilege to say that so and so should be more active in a community, be a more active citizen. I think we have to address economic insecurity because it's getting to be the national issue in my view. Thank you, Kip. And Ken. Well, I, I think we, we can only really do with three at the most, otherwise it's going to be quite a long session. So I, I did see you, so would you go ahead, please? Yeah. 
inspired to get at. Thank you. And uh, as it happens, that's a great lead into our third question, um, which is, are there contemporary examples of events, movements, and agencies uh, that are showing us other means for achieving political change? Brandon. Uh, thank you. Uh, two of the groups, obviously, were just mentioned there, which would be uh, Idle No More and Occupy. Um, I, I kind of sit between those two opinions on uh, Occupy as far as, well, there wasn't as much an opinion there, but it, it just that a lack of organization definitely did kind of hamstring it, and it made it so that uh, the actual message uh, that the average person saw was not fully understood. Um, this could be as much a uh, criticism of uh, the news media as it is actually of the, the movement itself. Um, and anything that's going to be, you know, uh, that kind of participatory uh, um, movement is going to have the issue of if you don't have a leaders, then, you know, everybody kind of speaks for you and not everybody's uh, viewpoints are going to necessarily represent the uh, movement as a whole. But, uh, um, and then, of course, I don't know more. I, I, I was far more impressed with that because I think it's, it's, it's similar in the sense of it's a, a shift, kind of a, a, a critical point hit where it's, it, it, action actually spills over. But uh, I think the difference with Idle No More is it, it, it's really teaching people to, uh, that have uh, traditionally in Canada been uh, overlooked or uh, grossly, uh, grossly uh, abused in a, a lot of ways when you look at the, the history itself. Um, it's a cultural shift. It's kind of what the larger Canadian culture needs to do uh, to, to becoming actively involved using community, community and connections to actually look for something better and to uh, get representation, which is something that largely has not been uh, and continues to be not available to uh, the native populations throughout Canada. Um, I think uh, uh, something else that should be discussed, and it's from the opposite end of the spectrum, is the Tea Party movement in the States, which is one that really did get involved politically. And uh, now, obviously, they are not uh, looking to, to the same goals as uh, any labor movement, but uh, it does show that, and it, it, it should be mentioned because there is a lot of backing from uh, interested uh, uh, powers that, you know, want their kind of reforms to uh, succeed, so they do have a better financial basis and treatment in the media. But it, it does show what actually engaging the political system itself and using the tools that do exist and largely uh, continue to be unused by the general population. It shows that you can actually get some things done, even if it's just to, well, in the case of the states, just hold up the... Uh, um, House of Congress, but, you know. But, yeah, I think uh, there are new movements, new agencies, and with social media, a lot of new tools, and uh, taking advantage of these and realizing the pitfalls that they also offer are going to be a very significant part going forward as to accomplishing some meaningful changes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Stephen. Uh, there are, of, of course, uh, many examples uh, of, of movements and, and agencies uh, that are showing positive political change, and uh, uh, s some of the courageous work that, that uh, progressive activists and leftists do in this country is a source of constant inspiration for me. I'd like to take on, just for a second, the notion that uh, movements like Idle No More and uh, Occupy movements that are leaderless, that, that don't um, bust out the old Roberts rules, um, are, are an example of anarchy and are to be sort of, are wasting space in, in the political system. I personally am someone who thrives on an ordered 60-minute meeting with a timekeeper, 
with very detailed minutes, and that's how uh, I operate, and that's how my friends organize. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to having a very structured environment in the way that people organize. But that is works for one really small group of privileged activists, I would, I would say, in, in the way that we operate. I think that movements like the Occupy movement and the I Don't Know More movement uh, make things like the resistance in Elsie Pogtog happen. Um, I think they also change the discussion that happens around people's kitchen tables uh, and that in, in effect gives uh, wind to uh, political decision makers to change the discussion that they have around what they are going to do as a party. Um, giving political entities and decision makers uh, a, a framework of, you know, 1% versus the 99% is incredibly powerful. And that discussion happened through a loose-knit group of people with not really any central focus with de predetermined outcomes that they were going to achieve. I think that kind of political organization is incredibly important. On the local, uh, moving to sort of locally, um, we looked at uh, a, a, a progressive movement recently in blocking the development of the Juan de Fuca Trail. Um, that was a movement that was a, you know, a loose-knit coalition of very many different people from a variety of backgrounds that came together and actually, you know, saved the trail. You know, we had a, had a win, and there wasn't a specific, predetermined outcome, central organizing body that did that. That was what I believe is true democracy, where people come together from a bunch of different backgrounds and sort of move in a general direction together without necessarily being dictated to by a central body. Although those sort of hierarchical organizing systems do have their place, I think we can be very effective outside of them, and I, and I don't believe that's anarchy. Um, or maybe it is. I'm, I'm not a theor... I'm not... Maybe someone who has a background in theory can answer that question better. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Thank you. John. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with Stephen about, like, I don't know more and, and uh, the Occupy movement. I mean, yeah, obviously they, it had its contradictions and its problems, but uh, I can say at least that it, it put ideas out there. For instance, the 1%, 99% idea. I mean, for people who aren't politic, who haven't been politically engaged, who don't have much political experience, that was something, obviously it's simplistic and maybe it's glib, but it's, it creates an awareness that, you know, that society is divided and that there are elites who are controlling the political system for their own purposes at, at people's expense. And it creates greater awareness of that. So I think that's, that's ultimately a good thing. You have to start somewhere. Um, yeah, for me, uh, uh, just a specific... Uh, someone mentioned it earlier, but the the living wage, uh, you know, fight down in the U.S. with Wal the Walmart workers and other workers down in the U.S. I see that as you know a good, uh, good positive thing. I think it's it's a great idea, the concept of a living wage that people need to make have a certain living in order to you know live dignified, decent lives. I think that's a great idea that should be pursued. Um, it also, the, the movements down there, the unions are part of it, uh, highlighting too the fact that, you know, places like Walmart and these major corporations that don't pay decent wages, essentially what's happening is, is that, that the fact they're not paying these wages, it's now, it's then being downloaded onto essentially state social services, you know, uh, basically more, you know, more food stamps and things like that have to be given out basically because people aren't earning enough of a wage. So it's kind of highlighting the, it's, it's a very, you know, palpable hi highlighting of, you know, so the idea of corporate welfare and that essentially corporations are basically getting away with paying these lousy wages and then just, it's just basically downloaded onto everyone else. Um, yeah, no, uh, I don't have much else here, but uh, yeah, obviously, uh, uh, actually, one country I look at as quite inspiring, and they've had a raft of problems, uh, uh, but uh, is a country called uh, uh, Bolivia, um, where despite being poor and really, you know, compa means-wise compared to Canada or other developed countries, they've passed laws. You know, they've passed the most 
uh, stringent animal rights laws. They've passed the most stringent environmental laws. And they've done it from an ethical, they've passed these laws from an ethical perspective that they say, yes, there's going to be economic consequences or whatever else, but this is the right thing to do. And this is, we want to set this example. So yeah, I see that as an example of actually where a government is doing something positive, so. I find uh, contemporary examples that I'm, I'm really um, <laughs> mobilized by or uh, inspired by are ones that uh, make the connection between uh, space and citizenship. Um, this One of the biggest sources of this was the Zapatista movement back in 94 uh, um, from their indigenous focus on place-based uh, resistance um, and their success uh, was noted by social activists around the world and I believe that's kind of part of where this this focus comes from um, and what it's about is taking up as a space and then redefining what that space means within that that community so Occupy is a great example where they took over uh, the Liberty Square and turned it into something something other than just this park for people going to Wall Street or walking through, where it became uh, uh, people within that area's identities were influenced by the social organization, the, the mobilization that was taking place there. And I think the, there's tons of social organization going on in these, and, and that th those are some of the first introductions for a lot of people to become who are becoming activists on on how these organizations go, I would. Um, so, and I, I believe this, the, the same can be said for Idle No More, and I think that they're doing incredibly important work blocking uh, particular developments. Um, so, yeah, and it occupies is does did have a statement in advance, despite the media's um, assertion that they had no no centralized one, um, and. Uh, you know, the demands were wide-ranging. They weren't specific policy changes, um, but their concerns were wide-ranging, and that's why it reflects that way. Um, the other, Occupy uh, Sandy, was also a, a branch of, that came off of that. After the large hurricane in um, New York, um, Occupy Sandy mobilized uh, collectively, um, non hierarchically to uh, find support the needs of the communities that was going through that crisis. Um, and the other offshoot of Occupy is the Rolling Jubilee, which has been very successful. They've uh, organized to uh, get in um, donations and then buying up people's debt because debt is traded on the market for way less than it's worth. Um, so they buy it up and then they cancel it. So tons of people's uh, you know, home debts, uh, student debts have been canceled through it. Um, I, so I, that's why I think it was a very successful, um, despite the kind of percep or the perception of it. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Um, okay, I would say just a comment on the anarchy thing that. I think that anarchists have a spot in our society, and I know it's an American example, but I think first of Alice Walker, um, who became a political prisoner in the early 1900s, engaged in a hunger strike, you know, and the president, President Wilson, said that her going on this hunger strike and being a political prisoner had no influence on getting women the right to vote. But did it really? I mean, who wants a stinking corpse on their doorstep, right? I think that it is always important that we value the work of anarchists in our society. Um, they do often exist on the margins, but I think that their work is relevant nonetheless. Um, and I think also if we look critically at this question, and even the end that says for achieving political change, well, are we looking for political change or are we looking for social change? And, and are those things the same or are they different? Um, and some of the agencies that I think of are um, things like Mud Sisters, who work in the Couch and Valley um, on Cobb houses. And so the way it works is you go and you do pay to take classes to learn how to build Cobb homes. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly how they're funded or how they work, but 
I know that you take these courses and it's primarily run by women and you learn how to build cob houses and you go out and you, you help the members build and you bank your hours. And when you get enough hours, everybody comes together and you build your own cob house. So, I mean, in terms of social change, well, that's incredible. That is, that is totally member-run, member-facilitated, and a means of finding a different way of looking at how we live. Um, so there's things like that, our eco-village, intentional communities that are popping up everywhere. I mean, I can't even count the amount of people that I go to school with who have this great idea that we're all going to buy property together and live on it and, and farm all of our own food. I think, I think that maybe so much, you know, and back to the question of youth, I think that maybe youth of today aren't, aren't looking so much to the political system to change things so much as our social our social system to change things well how if our political system isn't going to work for us well how can we change the way we live to to live more according to meaning or live according to to how we feel um, and I would also just like to point out the recent UN declaration of internet access as a human right because I think that that's really really relevant to this discussion and when I first heard this, I thought, that is totally ridiculous. Internet access is a human right. Don't we have more pressing issues at hand, like hunger um, and employment? But, but if you think about it, it's all about, it's all about access to information. And, and do we have informed citizens? You know, all of this is, oh, do you get involved? In, and what's the point in going and voting if you have no idea about the party's platform that you're voting for? And... Uh, yeah, so I, th I just think that that's a really interesting thing to pull into the mix as internet access as a human right and, and access to information and, and how keeping an informed population um, is what helps obtain political change and social change. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, very interesting views. Um, Any other responses or comments? Yes. Thank you. 
can actually get the word out and, and get people to get together and then go to the government as a group. And no matter how we get to that point, and if we can use social media or whatever to, to, to group together and organize, then that's a really powerful thing. And Richard Hughes, for example, has been doing all kinds of great stuff with his blog and getting, giving us all political alternatives and, and another voice, another uh, place to look for sort of a leadership type of role. So I think that whole thing is, is really useful and, and could be the, the, the change we're looking for in the next hundred years or the basis for. Um, and that really, again, is a good lead into the final question. Um, since today we're very conscious of the union movement and the role that it has played historically, and I'm sure along with myself, um, we all in many ways fear for its future. And it's taken such a, uh, an assault over uh, particularly the last 30 years and yet, as Alistair Pop pointed out in his remarks, um, in many ways it spearheaded change many years ago. So our question is, is there a role for the labor movement and unions in furthering and exploring alternative modes of political behavior? Stephen. Um. I'm, uh, I'm quite excited for this question. I uh, am very new to uh, organizing within the labor movement. I wouldn't consider myself a, a labor organizer. I primarily worked as an uh, uh, anti-poverty advocate, uh, but I've spent the last year working um, two days a week, well, a day and a half technically funded uh, to do employment standards outreach, so just educating various groups of non-unionized workers on employment standards law. Um, and a man did I have to beg to get that money. And I couldn't call myself an advocate doing the job. I, I was a public legal educator. Um, and I managed to get a little bit of funding to do that. Um, and while doing that, uh, I, you know, of course, have been uh, researching a great deal about the labor movement in Canada because I feel that there is a massive vacuum uh, in potential for progressive energy to come from this movement that I think a lot of us are very uh, skeptical of the labor movement and that it's, you know, gasping. Um, and I think there is great potential to breathe some incredible life into the labor movement. And uh, where that needs to start is a move away from the union officialdom as it stands today and the way that it organizes and structures unions around the collective bargaining agreement as its sole purpose for existing, uh, giving uh, rank and file members within the unions a real sense of belonging and, uh, and democratic interest in the organizing and operation of that union, and then looking outside of the union uh, the people who are, are paying union dues uh, to see what can be accomplished. And I believe that starts uh, with defending non-unionized workers, particularly marginalized workers, young workers, temporary foreign workers, uh, disabled workers, and elder workers. We have some of the worst employment standards law in this country, and before you can, as a non-unionized worker, go to find any sort of just result, you have to go to your boss directly with a 15-page self-help kit and enter in a discussion with your boss about a remedy with respect to the treatment that you're receiving. It's a completely flawed and, and, and crazy system of conflict resolution for workers to find actual justice through that kind of a process. And when I try to talk to unions about funding this, and sorry if there's union members in here who have received letters of me begging you for money, um, <laughs> but what we can do and see through representing workers that are facing this brutal piece of employment standards law is the value of being organized and standing up for your rights and what can come out of doing that. Uh, and this is happening in America, and I don't believe that it's happening in the same way that it could here in Canada. So I believe it's time for the labor movement and unions to take a, a, a very active role in uh, 
organizing with nonprofit and community groups to represent non-unionized workers who will one day be unionized. And that's a, a really, really important piece. And then very quickly, because I've taken a lot of time and I know you're rushing, but um, the one, uh, or not the only thing, but a great piece of the last platform in the provincial NDP election was the removal of uh, contributions from labor to political parties, as well as contribution, cor corporate contributions uh, to uh, partisan politics. Wouldn't think for one, just for a minute, um, number one, progressive heads, we know that we're never going to match the corporate dollars that go into politics in the same way that labor dollars go into politics. But if we stop, if the labor movement stopped giving all of that money to this political body and put that down into our communities, what would that mean for grassroots organizing in our communities? What would that mean for empowering people to be involved in that political process? If we put our energy into those people, then they will vote for progressive labor parties. But we have to show them why they, they should, and, and we can do that by helping them in their communities. And I, I think that's an important direction for labor movement. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Certainly, I think, sparked a lot of thoughts uh, there. Thank you, Steve. Um, we do have to keep our responses short at this point because time is going on. Uh, you don't have to be down to kind of tweet level, but um, if, if you can make it within, you know, 124 words or whatever, um, then that would be much Sure, yeah, Thanks, uh, Stephen actually laid it out pretty good. I sort of had similar thoughts. He, he uh, said it better than I, I could say it, though. Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, yes, unions definitely have a role, uh, but I think it's, it needs, the culture needs to be changed where the membership is, is leading the unions, in a sense, on these questions rather than, than following the, uh, the dictates of, of the leadership. I think that's, you know, I, I feel like I'm in BCGU, and I, I feel like the culture really is we kind of, you know, oh, they say to vote for this or do this, and we kind of just follow along, and there isn't a lot of, uh, we aren't really, you know, active independently within the union. We aren't really pushing the union to go in one direction or another. So, yeah. Thank you. Victoria. Um, I think I, I have very similar thoughts, and you bring up the idea of collective bargaining and moving away from that, and I think that that's so important. I think that that's a big part of unions, but it's important to move away from that and realize what unions can do beyond that. Um, and just a quick note that on the other question, I was thinking of an organization called Avaz, which is 100% member funded. And, and because of that, um, what they really work towards is the issues that the members want to lay out. And I think that unions could, could do a very similar thing, like you say, instead of fo going like top down focus, really, really looking at, at what the members want and, and trying to push that forward. Thank you. Can. Um, yeah, I would say that the uh, labor movement has one of the longest histories of uh, promoting other modes of political action, um, and they still are very much engaged in that in uh, different parts of the world. Um, and so I guess that all I would add is that um, it was incredibly important to uh, support other activist forms of citizenships when um, they're doing marches or, or blockades or occupations um, because what ends up happening is, is the dominant dialogue um, makes these out to be as, oh, they're d disturbing my, my way to work, my everyday action. Um, and the same thing is then turned on the unions when the ferry, strike, or ferry workers go on strike or, you know, we're, we're in the same boat when it, when it comes to that. Yeah. And Brandon. Thank you. Um, I'd say uh, looking at the question itself, it says uh, alternative modes of political behavior, and I think that's going to be a key part of it because uh, looking both federally and provincially, uh, both of the, uh, the NDP, the traditionally uh, labor-connected uh, party, has been moving far more towards the center and uh, in order to appeal to uh, the central uh, voters uh, for a larger uh, base of appeal. And uh, beyond that, I think in general, uh, unions have kind of uh, lost their way over the last little while. Uh, as a former union member myself in uh, 
247, uh, I found a just a mind-boggling situation where the union had literally split itself in half between two different tiers where uh, older workers were uh, basically guarded from uh, new concessions and newer workers were basically given a two-tier system exactly, even within a union itself. And it, it just seems to completely have uh, um, the very reason for it existing at that point is somewhat suspect. So thank you. Thank you. Um, responses? Yes. Thank you. Um, I've come down from the Comox Valley, and I think I've been in most of these events. So first of all, I want to thank the organizers for organizing this every year. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on one thing that Brandon said, and that was a sort of definition of politics that seems to be um, the frustration of everyone. That politics is have an opinion, keep it to yourself, and vote every four years. And that's not acceptable. The politics in the real world is a question of power. And right now, you have a very small handful of people that have power over the rest of us. And the problem that we're facing, students, workers, activists, is how do we gain that power? How do we empower ourselves? And it is through your organizations where you make those decisions and through these kinds of discussions that those issues get put on the table and discussed and actually addressed in a practical form. So I'd like to make one appeal to the youth and to the workers and to others, that when you look at politics, the electoral politi politics, is one part of it, and clearly that needs renovation. But it's not acceptable in our culture, generally speaking, to just say we're not going to vote. How about consideration to actually running for election, actually breaking out of that mode and putting forward one of your peers, whether it's a worker, a student, a youth activist, to, to, to make a break with the way politics is organized. So to say, no, I will not be beholden to a political party which is going to hem me in. I will not be beholden to a system that's going to hem me in. I will take a stand for those things that I'm fighting for, and I will run for election. I think that that sort of thing, in, in, in encompassing the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, actually contributes to breaking that political culture and introducing something new. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any further contributions, responses? Eden. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you, and I think that's a, a nice statement on which to conclude our discussion this afternoon. Um, Eden did mention to me before we wind up that I should somehow summarize uh, the uh, <laughs> discussion this afternoon. I, I'm going to try and avoid that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the interest not only of time, but I, I think these wonderful people uh, who, as some of you have remarked, uh, are so impressive, um, have left us all, I'm sure, with a summary in our own minds and many memories of their insights and, and intellect. So there's obviously a strong yearning for change, um, how we pursue that and the course that we pursue is still relatively undefined. But what I feel as a result of meeting these people and having this discussion is that at least we're on our way. And how that will evolve in the future is something that I feel inspired and excited to hopefully witness and be a part of. I'd like to thank you all, too, for contributing to this and making it such a rich discussion. Thank you.